We're very happy to have Song Yu from Columbia University speaking about open closed correspondence and mirror symmetry. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the uh, invitation and the introduction. It's very nice to speak here. And I might have some background noise, so I apologize for that and please bear with me. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, open closed correspondence and mirror symmetry. So this is largely based on joint work with uh, my advisor, uh, Chu Chu Melissa Liu at Columbia. And uh, there's some also uh, ongoing work, uh, which I'll hopefully, so which I'll mention at the end if there's time. So so please pre feel free to stop me at any time if you have any questions and or um, any comments. Okay, so let me just start by uh, talking about the setup here or the problem we're considering. So this is called the open closed correspondence, or originally in physics, it's known as some kind of uh, string dualities. So it's proposed uh, now more than 20 years ago by Mayer and Lersch Mayer. So the content, roughly speaking, is um, they have this observation on this uh, correspondence in genus zero between topological amplitudes of open strings on Calabial three folds, and on the other hand, closed strings on Calabial four folds. So um, the geometry is different here. So we have open geometry, which uh, wraps around some kind of brains in, in their um, st string background. And on the other hand, we just have the uh, usual closed strings. And the dimensions are also different. So we have three dimensions on one side and four dimensions on the other side. So these are uh, complex dimensions. So this is the physics proposal. And mathematically, uh, this suggests some relations between gromov witten theories. And that's what we're going to focus today. So in terms of gromov witten theories, uh, we can uh, rephrase the, the correspondence as follows. So on one hand, we have the open gromov witten theory on toric Calabial threefolds with some Lagrangian boundary conditions. So these are, uh, for example, virtual counts of uh, disks or um, other uh, maps from Riemann, open Riemann surfaces, or as I should say Riemann surfaces with uh, borders. And on the other hand, we have just the usual gromov witten theory, but now on uh, toric Calabial fourfolds. And, and we're, we're in genus zero uh, situation today. So uh, this correspondence is anticipated to hold on multiple levels. So the first one, we should have an honest equality between the numerical invariants as rational numbers for the individual curve classes. And then we can promote this to a, a, a correspondence at the level of the generating functions of, of these invariants. And uh, once we have that, we can look at the given tau style mirror symmetry. So uh, I guess one way to formulate that is there's this equality between J and I functions, where J is uh, a form of the generating functions of gromov with invariants, and the I functions are explicit hypergeometric invariants uh, functions. Which are mirrored to the J functions under under some mirror map. So we should have uh, some compatibility of this correspondence uh, between the mirror symmetry result, which is uh, fairly well known. So beyond that, we can uh, look more into the B model picture of the mirror symmetry. So um, it is known that there we have some families of smooth complex manifolds that are mirrored to our both our uh, three dimensional geometry and the four dimensional geometry. And we should have some correspondence between those mirror families as well. And furthermore, we can relate their period integrals and uh, discuss the picard fuchs systems of differential equations satisfied by these period integrals. And um, furthermore, we can also look at the compatibility of this uh, correspondence with wall crossings or Krebner transformations or Krebner resolutions. So on the one hand, we can um, do some Krebner resolution on the threefold and also change the location of our Lagrangian, and that should correspond to some Krebner resolutions on, on the fourfold. So I, I'll, I'll show an example if there's time at the end. And, um, and there, there, are, there are many more levels that we can discuss. And so much of this is still in progress. And in this talk, I'll be uh, mostly focused on the first three bullets, uh, which is in the joint work with Melissa. And uh, so, so we'll try to get through those. And uh, I'll, I'll briefly just discuss the last two bullets if there's time. So that's that's also roughly the, the plan for today. Uh, any any questions so far? OK, 
Okay, so let's just get started into the, the setup. So I'll, I'll just uh, say more about what the geometries here we're considering. So, and before I, uh, yeah, so before I go into details, here's a, a roadmap of our construction. So we start with an open geometry, which is, uh, which consists of a complex three-dimensional manifold X, uh, it will be a toric manifold, and a specific class of Lagrangians L in X. So we start with this geometry, and then we will arrive in the end at some closed geometry, which is toric fabial fourfold. But in the middle, we'll first um, uh, go to a relative geometry, which is obtained by um, partially compatibilizing x by some additional divisor d. And so we'll look at the relative geometry of x union d relative to d. And then we'll go to a local geometry, which is just a canonical bundle of, of x union d, basically. And this, uh, in this, at this step, we'll go from dimension three to four. And then, um, and then lastly, we'll go to the closed geometry. So I'll just start with, uh, from the beginning about on the open geometry. So as I said uh, before, X here will denote a complex three-dimensional toric calabial manifold. And in general, um, I think there's something in the chat. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so in general, it can also be an uh, overfold. And so our, our results were holding the case as well. But in this talk, we'll just uh, um, make her make herself uh, so make her lives easy and just restrict to the smooth case. So in, uh, this will be a non-compact manifold, and um, a, the simplest example is just these three. And so here I have some picture of, of these three. So on the left we have the three compact coordinate axes, and then you can look at sort of a tropicalization of this picture which is also the image under the moment map of some real uh, Calabial two subtorus, uh, which are denoted by TR prime uh, inside the algebraic three torus of X. So here the three axes will become these three um, rays um, in, the, in the plane. And um, the toric fan of this space is the cone over a triangle, just a single uh, smooth triangle. And this triangle is sort of the dual triangle to the uh, uh, tropical picture in the middle. So, so this will be our uh, run example, and this will actually show our, how our construction will work locally around around the point of interest. And uh, let me show uh, some more examples. So we can also consider this so-called resolved conifold, which is the total space of uh, O of minus one uh, plus O of minus one over P1. So the fan is the cone over this uh, square, which has a triangulation given by the diagonal. Or uh, we can also have this uh, so-called local P2 example, which is the canonical bundle, the total space of the canonical bundle of P2. So this has also been studied many, many place, uh, in many places or in many settings. And more general examples can come from just taking a canonical bundle of any toric surface. It doesn't have to be compact. And the toric fan will be a cone over the polytope, uh, which uh, is equipped with a triangle, a regular triangulation. So that's a more, a more general dis description of uh, toric carbial three folds. Okay. And I just like to say that we, here we make assumption that X is uh, semi-projective. And you can think about this as saying that X is a symplectic quotient. So there is a Hamiltonian action of uh, U1 to the K, which is, uh, so the torus and K here is the number of uh, k parameters in X. So we have this action on uh, C to the K plus three. And this has a moment map from C to the K plus three to just RK. And then X can be this, uh, described as the quotient of some fiber on, uh, of this moment map uh, by the torus, where here we just take R to be a Kähler class. And in this construction, the standard Kähler form on, on C to the K plus three will descend to the symplectic form on X. So, so that's a way of thinking about this. And there are many other ways to think about this condition. So equivalently, from an algebraic point of view, X is a GIT quotient. And, uh, and it also has this very simple combinatorial description, just saying that the fan, or the support of the fan is convex. 
So I want to make this assumption so that it's easier to talk about uh, generating functions and uh, mirror symmetry later, and we'll have some nice convergence properties. Okay, so, so that's our uh, threefold. And now let me go to the Lagrangian insight there that we'll uh, use. So we'll be considering this Lagrangian uh, of Agnadid Vapa type. So um, by definition, it can be recovered from this uh, symplectic quotient construction. So we just take some co-dimensional, um, real co-dimensional three constraint in, in the fiber and then, excuse me, uh, before we take the quotient. So that's not uh, probably not very easy to think about. So I'll give you some uh, other ways of other descriptions of this Lagrangian. So one way to think about this is that it's preserved under the action of the real uh, two torus. So if we look at the mirror map, uh, the moment map of that real torus uh, for the C3 example, uh, the Lagrangian will project to a ray uh, starting at a point, which is in the interior of one of these rays that corresponds to an axis. So uh, on the left here, uh, we have this uh, more uh, actual uh, picture. So the Grandjean will intersect one of these axes and bound a disk uh, on that uh, axis. So the intersection will be this red circle in the middle. So topo topologically, uh, this Lagrangian is non-compact and it's a union of uh, this, these real torus fibers. And it's uh, homeomorphic to S1 times R2, where this S1 is just this circle that you see uh, on this axis. So an important property of this Lagrangian is that in, it will always intersect a unique one-dimensional torus orbit or a, 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 one of these axes. And we'll assume that this orbit is non-compact. So it's a copy of, of C. So yeah, so the intersection of this Lagrangian and this axis will bound a disk in, in axis, which is this red shaded uh, region here. So I'll denote this by B, and the boundary of B will generate the first homology group of L. So this, the first homology will be a copy of Z. So it's, it's an infinite group. And um, the relative second homology of X relative to L will be um, a direct sum of H2 of X plus the class generated by B. So this will be giving our, um, our relative curve classes or, or effective curve classes for our um, open invariants. And we have this uh, still fairly simple description. And uh, so given this data, we'll also choose an additional parameter called the framing of L. So this will be an integer which will uh, denote by F. So we'll see how this comes into play later in the construction. Uh, so any questions so far? Okay, so, so that's that's about it for our, our open geometry. And we'll be considering the open gromo within invariants of, of this geometry, which are uh, virtual counts of stable maps from border Riemann surfaces to X uh, with border uh, with, with the boundary components mapped into the Lagrangian L. So these invariants are uh, very nice. And so originally they com uh, come from topological vertex construction where they were uh, related to certain relative invariants. And we have some very nice understandings of these invariants. For example, we have, we know that there's an all genus mirror symmetry statement for these invariants that translate them to some B model uh, descriptions. So this is, uh, this is the so-called remodeling conjecture. And we can also look at Kraepern, uh, uh, an analog of the Kraepern transformation or Kraepern resolution conjecture for these open invariants. Um, so and so, there are many things to do about about them, and our current project is motivated by uh, the goal of understanding them by relating to the closed invariants of fourfolds, which uh, which are more classical in some sense and uh, better understood. Okay, so um, so in this talk, we'll focus on the disk invariants, which are uh, maps from a uh, genus zero domains, which with one boundary component. So, so literally just a disk. And so um, to give the definition, we can first pick a curve class, which is an element of um, the relative homology 
H2 of XL. So this will consist of some curve class beta in X and some, some uh, multiple of this disk. So D times the class of D. And we can have some interior insertions to the inside interior of the disk. So, so they're, they're not on a boundary, but only uh, on the interior. So we pick some of uh, these classes, gamma one to gamma n in H upper two. And we can define this invariant, uh, which is uh, in this case defined by the localization of this real two torus, which acts on the pair XL. So this is the integral over the uh, virtual fundamental class of the torus fixed locus of this moduli of uh, open stable maps. And then we do, uh, so we pull back these insertions from X and then we take it over the virtual normal bundle of, of the fixed locus. And we do some weight restrictions to get a rational number. So this moduli space in general, it's uh, a singular stack and it has corners. But the fixed locus is actually very nice and has a nice, uh, also a nice algebraic description. So, so we can also explicitly look at the um, uh, the tangent obstruction theory. So, so, so we can actually compute this invariant very explicitly. So, so oh. that that will be the setup for us. Yeah. The interior insertions are these. Uh, is this like what the the curve class must pass through? Are these like constraints on? Yeah, the yeah, sort of like uh, that. This must pass through the Poincaré dual stuff. Okay. Uh, this, uh, yeah. So I, I know we're not in the uh, we're, we're in a non-compact setting, but this is yeah, this is analog of that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So so that's how we will define the, this invariant. So we'll come back to this later when we talk about the correspondence, but now let's go back to still to talk about the geom geometric setup. So the next uh, step in our construction is a relative geometry. So what we'll do is to add a new toric divisor D to our X uh, as some kind of partial compactification. And this position of D will depend on the position of our Lagrangian. So in, in the example before, we had C3 where the Lagrangian is on one of the uh, coordinate axes. So we'll just add this new divisor to compatify that uh, coordinate axis from a C into a P1. So this is the, um, so this is this uh, P1 line in the middle on, on the right-hand side of the picture. And our D is this red part, which is a copy of C2. Um, so we'll do this in a way that um, the, the degrees of the normal bundle of this newly created P1 is determined by F. So in this case, um, X union D is the total, uh, is, is total space of O of F plus O of minus F minus one over P1. So this framing F will give the so, sort of the local geometry of this space P1. So that's our relative geometry. and, and this pair is uh, the so-called log Calabi-L pair, which means that the canonical bundle is just O of minus D. And uh, from the construction, you can see that we have an isomorphism on curve classes. So from relative H2 of X relative to L to the H2 of this new total space, where we just map the disk to the class of the P1 that uh, results from compatifying this disk. Uh, by adding this new torus fixed point. So, so that's the that's the next step in our construction. A question? Yes, please. Uh, so here the compactification is uh, the x um, x union d is a uh, compact. Um, so everything will be non-compact still. Okay, x uh, x union d is non-compact. Yeah, so, so X union D is the total space of, in this case, a rank two vector bundle over P1. So it's okay. like a local P1 geometry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so everything in this talk, including the Lagrangian, will be non-compact. And that's also why we need to use uh, localization to define the invariance, because uh, the moduli space themselves will not be compact, but the fixed locus will be compact.
Okay. So, so yeah, let's continue with the construction. So we, once we have this relative geometry, we can take a local geometry, which is the total space of O of X union D minus D. So this will now become a complex four-dimensional toric Calabial manifold. So, so, so this is now Calabial. And um, so to go from, from this local geometry to our in, uh, resulting closed geometry, we'll just take, uh, again, a semi-projective uh, compatification of this local geometry. So we want this, um, so we want, we want to in the end get a semi-projective space so that it's easier to talk about mirror symmetry, for example. And this local geometry will always be smooth, but in general, this closed fourfold that we're getting in the end can have or can be an orbifold depending on depending on the choice of f. So let's let's uh, again go back to the C three example. So now I just have sort of this uh, um, toric fan description, and the fans of these spaces will be cones over these these uh, polytopes, or, or some of them are not uh, not convex. So on the very left, we have C3, uh, and this red dash, again, means the, the position of the Lagrangian. And as we see on the last, uh, last slide, so the second picture is the relative geometry, where we add a cone corresponding to the new divisor. So we get a local P1, and the degrees are f and minus f minus 1. So from the second picture to the third picture, we'll go up a dimension. So you see that the dimension of the polytope go, uh, goes from two to three. So that's where we uh, get to the local geometry. And so we will add a new factor of O minus one to, to this bundle over P1. And this O minus one, uh, it's basically because we have O of minus D uh, in, in the construction. So that, that also describes now uh, the degrees of the normal bundles of, uh, of P1 inside this uh, complex fourfold. And so to get to the last step, we will just uh, partially compatify this space. So uh, in this picture, we just added this green edge such that the resulting polytope is now a convex polytope. So, um, but we keep all the previous uh, triangulations. So in the end, in this example, we will get is a total space of a rank two bounded over this weighted projective plane P11F, and the degree is um, minus F minus one and minus one. So we get some, um, so we get some uh, Calabial geometry. <clears throat> so, so this is uh, roughly speaking what the construction looks like. So in general, um, we can have uh, arbitrary, uh, can start with an arbitrary threefold as the open geometry, but uh, locally, this is what's always going to happen, uh, depending on where the brain is. So on the other part of X, we'll just basically keep it as, as it is. And the only interesting changes will be uh, locally near the, the place where the Lagrangian is situated. So this description will be uh, always be valid for, for, uh, in, for general uh, com uh, constructions. So we have a, a sequence of inclusions, first from X to the compatification X union D, and then this is included as the zero section of, of this uh, canonical bundle, O of minus D, and then we do a final uh, partial compatification into X tilde, which will denote the, the closed geometry. So, so we'll call this uh, composition of inclusions as iota, and this will give us also the push forward of curve classes as well as pullbacks of, of insertions. So that will be uh, two ingredients that will come into our um, correspondence. So we'll be looking at open uh, gram witten theory of XL on, on the very left side, and then the closed gram witten theory of X, X tilde on the very uh, right side. And that's where we're going to get to next. Uh, so any questions about about the, the construction? Okay, so um, 
So let's uh, talk about the gram width invariance of the fourfold x tilde. So, so this is this is classical. So this is um, this is the most classic gram width theory. So we're just looking at virtual counts of uh, stable maps from uh, Riemann surfaces now without boundaries to x tilde. So we fixed some curve class uh, of x tilde, which I would call uh, beta tilde. And we again have some degree two insertions um, from the cohomology. And in this case, we'll have an additional fixed insertion, which is some degree four um, equivariant class supported on the fiber over this uh, new, newly added divisor. So this will be called uh, gamma, uh, just, this will just be called gamma tilde. So this will uh, will play the role of um, sort of fixing the last uh, fix, uh, mark point at the location of the new divisor. So that will, <clears throat> so intuitively that's uh, the data that remembers the location of, of our Lagrangian that comes from the threefold side. And we take the uh, degree to be four so that the virtual dimensions will work out. So again, we define this closed invariant by localization because uh, this geometry is again non-compact. So in this case, we'll use uh, a complex Calabria three subtorus of the algebraic four torus inside this uh, toric fourfold x tilde. So as you can see in the formula here, this is uh, also actually pretty straightforward. So we'll just take uh, an integral over the virtual fundamental class of the t tilde prime fixed locus of this uh, usual modular space and uh, zero n plus one bar. And uh, so we pull back the insertions and again, take them over the uh, <clears throat> the order class of the virtual normal bundle. And we, we have to make some weight restrictions to get from the torus weights to, to a, an honest rational number. So this, is, so this is also, as you can see, pretty similar to how we define the open invariance, although this is uh, much more classical. Than, than open case. So we can take any insertions we want and we always take this fixed insertion uh, gamma tilde at the end. Okay, so I, I'm now ready to state uh, the first main result of our uh, work, which is just a numerical open close correspondence that matches the open invariance with the closed invariance. So as for the setup, we take uh, some open curve class, which is a class in H2 of XL, and then we take the corresponding closed curve class, which is the push forward of that open curve, curve class. And we can have some insertions um, uh, on the interior of the disk from uh, H2 of X, and then we can choose appropriate lifts of them to uh, H2 of the fourfold X tilde. And the correspondence just says that uh, as numbers, these two invariants are literally equal. So the, this invariant uh, with these insertions are the same as the closed invariant uh, with the corresponding lifts and, and, and this additional uh, fixed insertion gamma tilde. So as I said, this, this additional insertion will remember sort of the data of the Lagrangian, um, intuitively speaking. Okay, so I'll, 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 we'll come back to the statement later, but I want to explain the proof. And the proof is by uh, this picture, basically. So on the left-hand side, we have, uh, so I, I draw an example of a torus fixed a stable map from a disk to our open geometry. So in this case, you can, um, uh, you can think of this map as uh, just a multiple cover of the disk that is bounded by the Lagrangian in, in the torus orbit. So we want to get from this open stable map to a closed stable map. And what we're going to do is actually very simple. We're just on, on the domain, we'll complete this, this into a P1 by uh, attaching another half to it. And now this P1 will map to the newly created P1 in, in the closed geometry, which is this um, half purple, half red uh, part. And it will cover this new P1 basically by the same degree. So, um, so in general, um, the, the geometry of X can be more complicated and the uh, stable map can have maybe more um, uh, irreducible components, but 
locally around the disk or around the boundary, this is always what we're going to do. So we just cap up the disk basically and map the new P1 uh, to the corresponding new P1 with the same degrees. So this picture will give us an injective map from uh, the components of the fixed locus of the moduli of open stable maps and into the components of, of the fixed locus of the moduli of closed stable maps. And um, so we can show that uh, for this corresponding component, their contribution to the localization definition is, is the same. So that's the main body of our correspondence. And um, so there are, of course, some additional components on the right-hand side that doesn't come from um, the open side. And we show that those components uh, don't have any contributions. So, so roughly speaking, that's the uh, outline of our proof. So yeah, so I guess in a word, because our invariants are defined by localization, our proof is also by localization. And it's the <clears throat> so the comparison, roughly speaking, works in this way. A question? Yes. So is the right-hand side arise already in the relative picture? Yes. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll actually go to that point uh, in, in a second. Yeah, okay. so the right hand picture is it's already there in the relative. So uh it's so yeah, let, let me let me let me talk about that actually now. So yes, so so the both sides of this correspondence are actually related to these intermediate geometries. So for example, they're related to the relative invariance uh, of this, yeah, as of this relative geometry. And, and the rel relation is uh exactly as you pointed out, it's also by this construction because now the, the cover of the middle P1 will have some tangency uh, with the relative divisor in the, uh, on the left-hand side of the picture. So the correspondence between the open invariance and the relative invariance is already known. Um, so it originates from this mathematical theory of the topological vertex uh, by Li, Liu, Liu, and Zhou. So in, in there, they actually define the open invariance using some kind of formal relative invariance. And then uh, Fang Liu studied this. Uh, so they started with this uh, definition on the moduli of open maps and um, also considered this uh, correspondence. And this is actually a very general correspondence. So this holds for all, gen all genera and any kind of boundary winding profiles. So we're not restricted to just this invariance. We can have a Riemann surface with higher genus and multiple boundary components. And because uh, the open and relative invariance can be defined for any genus and any such profiles, the correspondence also holds um, in that generality. So on the other hand, the relation between the relative and the closed invariance can be thought of as an instance of the so-called log-local principle by Van Gero, Weber, and Rudat. So what the principle generally says is that we can start with some um, relative geometry. So we have, for example, a, a manifold and a normal, simple normal crossings divisor. And we can look at the log invariance with uh, maximal tangency with each of the components of the divisor. Um, and then the, those invariants should be uh, the same as, or up to sign as the local invariance of, of uh, the same geometry. So uh, if we think about, if we uh, identify the log invariance with the relative invariance, then our correspondence is, gives a general class of non compact examples for this principle. And with the, they also generalize certain examples of this recent work of Busseau, Brini, and Van Gero from uh, considering Luanga pairs or uh, uh, log labial uh, surfaces with maximal boundary. So this is sort of a breakdown of our correspondence uh, with respect to this uh, chain of constructions that we started uh, in the beginning. So, uh, but I guess we'll mostly focus on the correspondence on two end sides, so the open and close. Okay, so I just wanted to say a word that um, this numerical correspondence has some potential applications uh, that could be interesting for future studies. So 
because of this uh, equality, we actually have some uh, correspondence between the structures on the Gromowitan theories on the two sides. So, and because the closed Gromowitan theory is much more, it's, so it's well known and has many more results, we can hope to use those to study the structures of open Gromowitan theory in our setting. So, for example, we can try to think is, is there an analog of the WDVV equations in the open setting, or we can look at the uh, open closed Gopa Kuma Vafa invariance correspondence or BPS correspondence, and, and so on. So, I'm not um yeah so um so this is for for possible future directions okay so let's go back to this uh roadmap at the beginning so right now we've only went through the first bullet which is the numerical correspondence and but now once we have this, we can quickly get some, promote this to higher levels. So we will now talk about the generating functions and compatibility with mirror symmetry. And, and for the last two bullets, uh, I'll see if I can get through those, but it's okay if we don't have time. So, um, so we will now go on to talk about generating functions. So again, uh, here's some, some setup uh, to define the generating functions. So we'll take a basis of the second cohomology uh, of X and both X tilde. So we start with uh, U1 up to UK up, uh, in X, and we take some appropriate lifts of them to X tilde. And so the fourfold X tilde has an additional Kähler parameter. So we need to take additional class that completes the, these lifts into a basis. So the class we'll take would be the class of the, the toric divisor that corresponds to our uh, newly added D. So that's a basis of uh, H upper two that will help us parameterize the insertions. So we'll set uh, this bold face uh, tau two to be a general class of the second cohomology in X. And correspondingly, we have tau tilde of two. And we'll just take a T to be additional variable for the open sector. So which will show up in a minute. So with this setup, we can define the generating functions. So for the, this invariance, we'll take, uh, so this will be denoted as F. So this will be depending on the insertions uh, tau two and the, uh, the open variable T. So this will be a sum over this effective uh, relative curve classes, beta, beta prime, and we'll take a sum over non-negative integers n. So we'll have this, this invariance with tau two inserted n times over n factorial. And then we'll have this t parameterizing sort of the degree of, of the boundary. So that's the d here. So this is the this is a generated function packaging all possible this invariance. So on the close side, we have a much a very similar and more classical uh, definition, which is this double bracket uh, notation uh, around our fixed uh, insertion tau uh, gamma tilde. So this will be a sum over, uh, again, the curve classes beta tilde. And at, for the invariance, we'll insert this tau tilde 2 to n times, but we'll always insert our fixed insertion gamma tilde. And again, we take it over uh, n factorial. So normally, I guess for this generating function, we will also have some novical variables, but here you can think of them as being uh, specialized to one. So we only keep track of variables that parameterize the insertions. And on the open side, we have an additional open variable. Okay, so, so that's some uh, notations for the generating functions. And our next result just says that these functions are equal after we relate these um, variables. So for the first k variables, which are the killer parameters of the threefold, we just literally have uh, tau a of tilde is equal to tau a. So we identify them on the nodes. And um, so we have this additional killer variable on the fourfold side, which is this tau tilde k plus one. And this is related to the open variable, which is t by, so this is equal to log of t. So the general idea is that uh, the open variable should correspond to this additional closed variable on, on the fourfold side under this correspondence. 
So, so once we make these change of variables, then the generating functions are, are uh, equal on the nodes. And they're actually, they're actually equal term by term. So that's what, how we prove. So that's how we prove it. So basically, we take a, we uh, zoom into each individual curve class and apply our numerical correspondence to match the, the uh, Gromovic invariance. And then we package them together under into this generative function. Um, could you uh, clarify again the part in blue, the T, the lo lowercase t is corresponding to the open sector you said? Uh, yes. Uh, so, so uh, okay, so this is, uh, this is, uh, I guess another way of thinking about this is through the divisor equation. So, so T to the D can be thought of as um, E to the um, log T, but, uh, uh, d times log t, and this d is basically if you pair this additional insertion on the fourfold side with with the divisor. So so that's that's how we sort of extract this gamma tilde in out in, uh, into the um, oh sorry not gamma tilde. So we extract the last variable uh, in tau tilde two, which is this closed insertion, and that so that parameterizes the additional divisor. And our map will intersect that divisor with order D. So, so we, we just pull that class out under the divisor equation, and that's that's how we get um, T to the D in the end. I see. So tau, t tau tilde K plus one is encoding the intersection with the divisor. Yes. So that's that's why we need to choose uh, this as our particular choice of basis. OK, thank you. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very. Uh, yeah, that's a very important part of the proof, actually. Okay, so yeah, so we have this equality of functions, and you might want to ask why this is interesting. So, um, so we have a much better understanding of the right hand side for the usual uh, closed Gromovian theory. So, a, a description from uh, that and from quantum cohomology is that this. Uh, one one point insertion generating function can be recovered from the fundamental solution to the quantum differential equation. So this gamma tilde double bracket can be recovered as roughly speaking, we can apply the fundamental solution to the uh, class gamma tilde and pair it with one. So here we have some equivalent pairing and we need to take some coefficients. Uh, so we need to take z to the minus two coefficient of the loop variable z because just because of degree reasons. So um, so we should we can recover this generating function by pairing uh, by this pairing. And this pairing is also equivalent to we, if we pair the uh, to a class gamma tilde with the J function of, of X tilde. So that's also uh, uh, well known in, in quantum cohomology. So um, this gives us a way of recovering this closed generating function from the J function. So the, uh, yeah, so under the correspondence, we can get the following results. So we can get the uh, generating function of this invariance of the threefold by pairing the uh, J function of the fourfold with our fixed class gamma tilde. And so here, uh, because we're in a non-compact setting and we define things equivalently, we, we again take the equivalent concrete pairing and we take some weight restrictions. And we take the coefficient of the certain power of z, z uh, just for degree reasons, uh, it's, but it's not very important. So, so this is another sort of restatement of our correspondence for generating functions. So we can recover the this function from, from the j function. So I guess the reason we're doing this is uh, leading into mirror symmetry. So as I said in the beginning, uh, a version of mirror symmetry due to a given tau and others says that the J function can be related to the I function on, on the mirror side. So, and the I function is some very explosive hypergeometric function. So let's try to put this uh, result into context. So we have this, uh, so we have this diagram. So um, where the, uh, our correspondence before is this uh, edge on the left-hand side, 
So we, we can go from the J of the fourfold to the uh, generating function of this invariance. So the left-hand side is our uh, A model open closed correspondence. And as I said, the bottom arrow is this classical toric mirror theorem due to given tau and also codes Corti, Ritani, and Zeng in the orbital case. And it's also studied uh, using, uh, for example, the quasi map world crossing techniques. So it just says that the J is equal to the I, well, in, in this equivariant setting under some closed mirror map, which relates the A and B model um, moduli parameters. And here I is some explicit hypergeometric function in the B model variables. So I denote them by uh, Q tilde here. So this uh, open uh, this mirror symmetry on the closed sector actually has an analog for the open sector. So this is the top arrow here in this diagram. So this is an open mirror theorem. So it's uh, originally conjectured in physics, but proven uh, for in math by uh, Feng Liu and Feng Liu and Zeng, also for the orbital setting. So the the statement of this theorem is that um, our generating function of this invariance is equal to also some uh, B model explicit hypergeometric function, which were called W. And so uh, you can think of them as some B model analog of the I function for the open side. So this relation is uh, should hold under the usual closed mirror map and additional open mirror map that relates the, uh, the open variables. So here, um, this W depends on the closed variables Q and an open variable X, and this X should be related to, to this open variable T on A model side. And again, this W is very explicit and we can write down, write down the, all the coefficients basically by hand. So an analog of our A model correspondence is the uh, B model correspondence, which is the right arrow. And so this says that we can recover the B model disk function W from the I function of the fourfold. And what we do is basically the same. So we take the I function and we pair it with the, our fixed class uh, gamma tilde under some equivalent pairing. And we do the usual um, weight restrictions and take the coefficients of Z minus two. So here, um, the change of variables is also very similar. So we just identify the first k variables and we take the additional uh, close variable to the open variable. So this is the like analog state, uh, completely analogous statement of the, of the left arrow. So the upshot here is that we uh, can establish the left and right sides um, and, and actually independently. So for the right side, I should say that this is just by uh, explicit computation. So we, we just write down the two hypergeometric functions and we, we just identify them. So we can establish the left and right sides and we check the uh, sort of the commutativity of this diagram by uh, tra keeping track of all the change of variables. And as a result, we can also recover any of the top and left and right arrows from the other two. So, um, so, so these relations will work together very nicely. So, so yeah, so in this sense, we sort of verify a compatibility of our correspondences with, uh, with the, this uh, given tau style mirror symmetry. Okay, I think my time is up, so I'll, I'll, I'll just stop here and uh, uh, yeah, and I'll see if there are any questions. Okay, well, let's first thank our speaker. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, any questions from the audience? Well, maybe I'll start. So um, you mentioned something about uh, Gopakumar Vafa version. Oh, uh, yes. Could you maybe say a word about that? Or... Um, yeah, so that's that's all much, uh, uh, I guess that's all still very speculative. 
So uh -huh. the, the idea is that we have this um, equality between the ground width invariants, and we can just feed them into the defining equation of the Goba Kuma Waffle invariants from the ground width. And uh, so that should actually lead to some equality between the Goba Kuma Waffle invariants. So I guess the question is can we say something about, for example, integrality or uh, finiteness on either side? And um, so the right hand side would be like a a four-dimensional version of Gobukumar. Yeah, four-dimensional version. So this is actually also part of the conjecture of the paper by Klan and Ponder Ponder for the four-dimensional case. So, so yeah, so if you can say, for example, something about integrality on one side, then we know that for the other side. And so that's something, I, I thought that would be something interesting to look into. I see, but, the, and, but this would involve like a, a higher genus version of the, of the opening uh, so this is uh still in genus zero so i guess uh yeah so i should say that this work is all, all in genus zero and so for four folds because we don't have any interesting variants beyond genus one so I, I guess one can look at if there's an if there's something to say about genus one but that's that's sort of it so i see uh, and maybe just one more question so is there um is there expected to be any any analog of the of this uh, open closed correspondence in higher dimensions, or is it is it uh, very particular to this uh, four dimensional three dimensional construction? Yeah, I think that's also an interesting thing to think about because in higher dimensions, so take higher dimensional toric club L, and you can look at an analog of this Lagrangian, but now uh, H one will have higher dimensions, so you have more open variables, and then you can construct a closed geometry out of that and. I don't think it's now clear that what the, say what the dimension of the closed geometry is, but but I think we can. There's something to try there. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So this is this is still all just speculations, <laughs> nothing concrete. And other questions. Okay, well, if not, um, yeah, thanks again. That was a really nice talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.